Hey friends, welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church of the Brethren. I'm Pastor Paul Bartholomew, and it's great to have you here with us again today. So thank you for that. Uh, today finds us in our second installment of the series that is called Fellowship with the Faithful One. As uh, we take a look into 1 John, the book of 1 John, it's one of those little letters, the little epistles that uh, John, the writer of the gospel, and John the Revelator, that guy, he wrote these three epistles to the church of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so, uh, we're looking into 1 John. We began the series last week. We made it then through chapter 2, verse 2. And, uh, and so we're starting now with a message that's called Fellowship with the Faithful One, Horizontal Hold. Uh, and so we'll be covering 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 14. Again, glad that you're here with us. Uh, let's turn to prayer before we turn to the Word. All right? Father God, as we gather today, we so thank you, Lord, that you give us this privilege to come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. And the assurance, Lord, that we can find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need because Christ went before us. So God, we so give you thanks. Um, Lord, on this day, there are hearts that are heavy, and we thank you, God, to know that Christ has, in the ultimate sense, been our burden bearer, but we thank you to know, Lord, for those whose hearts are heavy, though, that, that we can still bring those burdens to the one who uh, bears our burdens before you. God, for those who are weary and need to find a much-needed rest in the truth of your word, then, God, we thank you that you can meet them there. God, for those who need wisdom and understanding, uh, God, you are all wise. And so we thank you, Lord, for the discernment that your Holy Spirit provides. Father, for those who would, um, uh, and, and which would be each of us, as we turn to your word, God, needing the, to be strengthened and sustained through the truth that it brings, then, well, Lord, we just uh, pray and wait in expectation. God, that you would teach us, that you would feed us, that you would strengthen us, inspire us, encourage us, correct us, rebuke us, train us in righteousness, we pray. For the glory of your great name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so once again, we're in 1 John, and um, a couple things that I love about this epistle, you can see them in today's text. Uh, I guess I didn't mention them necessarily last week, but a couple of things that I love about this, this particular letter that John wrote, this epistle uh, that John wrote to, to the believers in Christ. As we see in other books of Scripture, one of them being that as we see in other books of Scripture, uh, we get a glimpse of the human author's personality. Uh, as it shines through, uh, we get glimpses of John's heart for the church. And so he uses such tender terms when you perhaps noticed in 1 John as chapter 2 starts out, he says, my dear children, my dear children, I write this to you so and, and throughout. You see this tender heart of this old, I hate to say war horse, but, uh, but this old man of God, this, this servant, this suffering servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who had witnessed and testified to the things that he had heard and seen and even put his hands on in reference to literally physical contact with the living Christ. And so he wanted to make sure out of his, his deep love for, deep passion for the church, he wanted to make sure that they understood the confidence that they could have in Christ. You know, another thing that we see is not only John's heart, but we also see uh, this recurring theme through this letter is that he, he says, I want you to know, to live with assurance in Jesus Christ. He didn't want to leave anything up to guessing. He just, he so often displays his uh, desire that we may know. And, uh, and if you're into this kind of thing and you want to just take time to, 
to read through the letter of 1 John and say, how many times does he say no? You know, that ye may know. Um, he, he so wanted us to live in assurance with Jesus Christ. I'll talk with you more about that, but, but I guess the reason I love that is because I know a lot of, uh, I've run into a lot of believers who over the years are like, I just, I just wish I could be confident that I am in Christ. You know, I don't know. I, I, you know, when you ask somebody, hey, so, so where do you plan to spend eternity? Oh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I hope I've been, I hope I've done, I hope whatever. The scripture is so plain that we can know that we belong to Jesus Christ. And if we know we belong to Christ, then we can have confidence that we are living, I mean, that we are headed for that place that he has gone to prepare for us. And so, John's all about that. We see his heart, his tender heart for the church, and we see that deep desire. He said, no, I, I want you to know. I don't want to leave anything to guessing. So, anyway, so here we go. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 14, a message entitled, Fellowship with the Faithful One, Horizontal Hold. I did pull that title up, by the way, from... From the old days, I'm old enough that I remember the horizontal hold and the vertical hold uh, little uh, buttons on, on the TV. Well, anyway, I couldn't tell you much about those, but except that they were to make sure that, that, uh, that there was a, a, a solid signal, that, that it wasn't wavy, that it wasn't distorted, but that it was pure. Well, if we're going to take a look at the horizontal hold, as John unpacks for us, okay, so we, we want to say that our relationship with God is great, that that vertical relationship is great. What about our relationship with others, with our brothers and sisters? Well, we're going to see. So follow along with me. If you have your Bible, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he says, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Well, dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. The old command is the message that you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness. He walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Let's see if we can unpack it here a bit. So if you look down at verses 3 through 6 with me, Go back to verses 3 through 6. You know, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. So John immediately steps into this and says, listen, you can have assurance that you know him. Now, that, that knowing uh, is not simply knowing about. Uh, it, it suggests an intimacy with God. That sweet fellowship with God. You can know that you have come to know Him. And it's like, oh, this is awesome. Just tell me what I need to do that I might have that assurance. He said, great. Great. You want to know that assurance? You want to know 
that you are in fellowship with him, that you have that intimacy with the Most High God. You want to know that? Then obey his commands. Obey his commands. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Obeying commands. I mean, come on, doesn't that seem so legalistic? That seems like we're going back to the law. Is that what he's talking about? You know that, that we can have intimacy with God. It's like, well, that doesn't sound like relationship at all. That sounds like religion. Well, let me ask you about your relationship. I know you don't get a chance to answer me, but let me ask you about your relationship. Um, if you're married, your relationship with your spouse. Now, somewhere along the line, you have learned that which is pleasing and that which is displeasing to your spouse, right? Now, I'm assuming if your relationship is healthy, they do not tell you what to do and what not to do. I mean, it's not how a healthy marriage works. But your knowledge of what pleases and displeases moves you to respond in certain ways to them, doesn't it? If you know that there is something, if you love them and you know that there is something that is, that is displeasing to them, that they find irritating, annoying, uh, whatever it might be, distressing to them, if you love them, are you going to do that? Well, no, because you know their heart in the sense that it's like, no, you know what? That's going to be hurtful. That's going to be frightening. I, I can't do that to them. Not if I love them. Well, guess what? God's word. Now, it is true that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The Bible is very clear on that. And so you say, okay, well, but why are you talking to me about these commandments then? Well, um, all of the commandments, first off, have been, have been summarized in loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and the second like in loving our neighbor as ourself. All of the commands summarized into those two. But, but listen, so loving God with all that I have and all that I am, loving him with my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, now, if God's word, as I read through the law, as I read through the, the, the teachings of Christ, does it not tell me and you what kind of things are good and right and pleasing? Do we not learn in there the kind of things that God hates? Do we not learn in the rest of, you know, in the law, the things that God loves? So then what is our love response to the Father? Well, if we love him, and we're going to obey his commands. Not because we're trying to earn our salvation. Not because we're trying to, to win something from him. But it's a love response. You know, you can know that you have come to know him intimately if you obey his commands. In other words, we submit to the lordship of the living word, Jesus Christ. And we live in obedience to the written word. Now, here's the great thing. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, and I just flip a page so I don't mess it up for you. This is love for God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. This is love for God to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. His commands are not burdensome. Again, it comes out of that love relationship that we have with him. So we're not talking about, you know, we're not trying to once again replace relationship with religion that's not it but if i am in a love relationship with god his commands are not burdensome it's a joy to be able to serve him once again think back to a love relationship that, that you're a part of whether it's in your marriage or maybe you're dating and maybe you think about uh you think about the love that a, a parent has for a child and and we see those needs and it's like you know listen i'm I, it's not a burden. Uh, does it make me tired sometimes? Sure, but it's not a burden. Well, in 1 John 5, 3 reminds us, he says, no, listen, it's, God's commands are not burdensome. But you want to know that you live in him? You want to know that you know him? Well, then what's your attitude toward submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ? 
Uh, you've heard me say it oft times before, but Christ is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He calls the shots in our lives. What is your attitude towards submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? What is your attitude toward living in obedience to, the, to God's holy word? I had a lady uh, tell me one time, uh, she says, well, listen, I don't care if that's what the Bible says. I'm not buying it. What a rebellious heart. What a rebellious heart. Tragic, tragically, she died a horrific death. Uh, one day, I only pray that before she came to the end of her life, that she softened her heart toward the written word of God. Because this is how we can know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Notice then again in verses 3 through 6 that John is all about, he says, no, listen, I just want you to have this assurance of salvation. For he says, you know, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys God's word, then God's love is made, truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we're in him. So again, he's like, church, I just want you to know, I want you to live in this assurance that you are in Christ. This is how we know that we are in him. If whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. I've talked to individuals who said, oh, no, listen, all my past covered by the blood, all my future covered by the blood. I can live however I want. I don't have to submit any longer to the demands of the law, not in salvation. But again, listen, do we want to know, do we want that assurance of being in him? Well, whoever claims to live in him must Walk as Jesus did. And so, friends, I don't think we can get around uh, the fact that our life, the way we live our lives matters to God. And so we have to stop with this nonsense about, well, we're no longer under the law. We're under grace as an excuse for ungodliness. Are we no longer under the law but under grace? Of course that's true. Scripture says that. But that was never intended to be used as an excuse for our ungodliness. For unholy behavior. For, for, for conduct that was clearly not in keeping with being a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we have to stop that nonsense. How we live, of course, matters. For whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. It's not only here that we read this, by the way. So this isn't John, the old guy, getting near the end of life, who said, hey, listen, he's gotten a little old, a little crotchety. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Philippi, said, listen, you make sure that you're living your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. Does that not sound like how we live matters? Friends, I don't know. I, and, and again, he's not talking about earning salvation. He's talking about living holy and godly lives. When the scriptures called us, God called his people to come out from among them and be separate and we find ourselves, the church in America at least today, so obsessed with how can we blend in to the scripture so that we can somehow sneak up on them with some evangelistic tactic. That is not biblical, flat not biblical. He's called us to come out from among them and be separate. He has called us to live lives worthy of the gospel. He has called us to live such good lives. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, when he says, let your light so shine. Remember in 5, 16, he says, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so Christ himself reminding us that, no, how you live matters. I, 
I have to tell you, I see an awful lot of people who profess faith in Jesus Christ that have a complete disconnect from Sunday morning. As uh, Casting Crowns had that song about between the altar and the door, they forget their follow through between the altar and the door. I mean, we can sing all the right songs, make all the right statements, raise our hands just the right way at just the right point, walk down the aisle on the third verse of just as I am. But we get back out of church and all of a sudden it's like we, we're this chameleon. All of a sudden it's like, okay, hold on, wait a minute. Was not that which you were taught, that which you heard, that which you saw, that you, which you witnessed in worship, was that not intended to be transformative in your life? I believe it was, in your life and in mine. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, again, we see, let me get into 1 Peter, then it'll make more sense. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Dear friends, I urge you, this is verse 11, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul and live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Guys, how we live truly matters. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. Now, listen, I don't know if everyone listening to this message is a believer, and so let me just, uh, let me just tell you, are there those who make false professions? In other words, are there those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ who flat do not follow him? Absolutely. Just because someone says they are a Christian doesn't mean that they are a, a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And so Jesus actually said this in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. In other words, Jesus said, just look at the fruit. Just look at the fruit. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Let me say that again, echoing again the words of Jesus Christ. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. And so here are the words of Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. In other words, I, I was never your Lord Oh, you called me that, but you never submitted to my lordship. Then I will tell them plainly, Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So let's press on. But listen, if you need to pause right there and just spend some time in prayer, then I want to encourage you to do that. You can always hit the, so one nice thing about the recorded message, you can always just hit the pause button and spend some time right there. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Maybe you got some time of confession coming up. You just need to talk to the Father. Maybe you just need to pause and pray right now so that you might have that assurance that is in him. So you do that, if you need to, hit your pause button, uh, the rest of us are going to continue. But verses 7 and 8, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command. He goes on to say, yet I am writing you a new command. In verses 7 and 8, what is that about? Well, chapter 2, 
verses 9 through 11, says this, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. So whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He who does not know where he does not know, excuse me, where he is going, because the darkness has blinded him. Flip over into 2 John, uh, the next little one. It's only one chapter long, but verses 5 and 6. Now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning, not from uh, the beginning uh, before the beginning of time, not that, but from the beginning. When we first heard the truth of who Jesus Christ is, we have heard this, known this, from the beginning. It's even echoed, by the way. What he's about to say uh, is, is echoed. It's in the, we find it first in the book of Leviticus, which is why he's saying, he says, hey, no, I'm not writing you some new command. This is old news. Well, let me get back to 2 John 5 and 6. I'm not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning. Verse 5 I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And so we go back again. I mean, think back. I mentioned the greatest commandment earlier, but, but in the greatest commandment, what is the greatest commandment? Uh, well, that to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the second one. So the first one being to love God with all of our being, all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. So in 2 John 5 and 6, when he says, no, hey, listen, uh, this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. In other words, it's submitting to, it's putting him first, uh, loving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So in so doing, it's like, okay, well, God, I'm acknowledging you then as sovereign Lord. The greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we see it again. And, and this is where actually the, the message title came from, the horizontal hold. Look down in verses 9 through 11 of our text today, 1 John chapter 2, 9 through 11. Uh, I just read it for you, so I, I will only begin. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. And so Christ followers, and I have to tell you, I hear this all the time. Oh no, all is well with my relationship with God, but I just can't forgive what so and so did to me. We have to stop with that nonsense. If we're a follower of Jesus Christ, if Christ is Lord of our life, if we are loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we will obey His commands. And His command is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. I, whoever claims, back to verse 6, whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. And guys, just thinking about this, how did Jesus walk when it came to dealing with the likes of me and you? Did he just say, oh no, listen, I got this awesome relationship with my father, but I can't forgive what you did to me. Is that how Christ met you? It's not how he met me either. Mercy there was great and grace was free, the, hymn, the, the hymnist wrote. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. I, I found that forgiveness in him. And so listen, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Now we have to remember, according to verse uh, chapter 1, verse 5, uh, God is light in him. There is how much darkness? No darkness. No darkness in him. 
And so we have to stop with the nonsense of all is well in my relationship with God. Me and God, we're good. It's me and that person over there that I can't stand. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Does not work that way. Anyone who hates claims to be in the light. So there again, there is that claiming thing. And John's saying, it's one thing to claim, it's another thing to live. It's one thing to state, it's another thing to be. Anyone who claims, anyone can claim that they're in the light. But if a man hates his brother, he's still in darkness. Well, guess what? There is no darkness in God. So if we're still in darkness, we are not in Him, church. If we have that habitual, hateful spirit towards somebody, then we are still in darkness. And God's light and life is not in us. Again, the, the, the Greek word that's used there does speak about an habitual state. So it's not talking about, man, that guy really honked me off and, and I was angry for a few hours one morning. But that habitual hateful spirit that comes where, where uh, you know, a, a root of bitterness grew up into this, this hateful spirit that didn't last a, a minute or an hour or even a day, but just became this, uh, it, just, it just welled up in us. Uh, listen, guys, when that becomes habitual, when that becomes characteristic of us, then we should rightly question our relationship with God. Because if we are in fellowship with Him, if we claim fellowship with Him, but still live with a hateful heart, we are not in Christ. That's not my words. That's His words. John goes on to give us another word of warning that when he gets down there in verse 11 and says, listen, so the one who hates his brother is in darkness. He walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going. The darkness has blinded him. And so, friends, we have to understand, again, no darkness in God. And so when we... Uh, when, when hatred characterizes our lives, then we have to understand it's no wonder we're stumbling in darkness. It's no wonder we have great difficulty understanding the right way to go and, and, and making good choices. Because according to the scriptures, if we hate our brother, we're still in darkness. That's where we're living. Hatred blinds. And builds a wall of separation. And that, and that wall only is removed. That blindness only is restored to sight. When we turn to the one who is truly light. <clears throat> I love that because he even says there in verse 10. That whoever loves his brother lives in the light. There is nothing in him. To make him stumble. There is nothing that causes the one who loves his brother. Uh, who is walking in that light. There is there's nothing there to cause him to stumble. Not so with the one who hates his brother. So once again, he just brings us back and says, okay, listen. It's not only this relationship that matters. It's these relationships that matter. The health of the relationship with the Father absolutely uh, impacted by the health of the relationship with our brothers and sisters. <clears throat> so let me wrap this up. The, the Apostle uh, John gives a word of encouragement to the church. He addresses uh, what I believe are these three levels of spiritual maturity when he talks about the children and the young men and then the fathers. Uh, the fathers. And so I've just pulled these out. Uh, I write to you, dear children, John said. And, and he said this, two th ways that he addressed, why he addressed the young children. He said, I, I write to you, dear children. First off, he says, because your sins have been forgiven. I love it that he addresses the earliest believers, the ones who are, are, are at the youngest part of spiritual development and says, listen, remember that your sins have been forgiven. Remember that it was on account of his name, not account of your name. 
Remember that. And church, that's something we need to, we must never lose sight of. Because it's that very truth that makes verses 9 through 11 possible. For us to live in love. For us to live in forgiveness. When we think about the way that we have been forgiven, you know, Scripture calls us, listen, forgive as you have been forgiven. And I, I look at the way that I have for, been forgiven in Christ Jesus. And then it had nothing to do with my goodness. The forgiveness that I received uh, that, that came ultimately through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross had nothing to do with me. Hey, uh, dear children, your sins have been forgiven on account of His name, not your own. As a result, you've got plenty of forgiveness to offer to those who have sinned against you. As a result, there is no reason for you to allow hatred to well up in you, uh, to, develop, to develop this root of bitterness that becomes a characteristic of our lives. Remember, children, dear children, your sins have been forgiven on account of His name. And then he goes on to say, uh, as, as, as we're mindful of our own sinfulness, uh, again, uh, and, and our desperate need for grace and mercy, then it's like, okay, it's, it's all good. I can, I can offer that to you because I've experienced it. I received it freely. I can pass it on freely. But then he also says, hey, uh, dear children, you've got intimacy with the Father. What an incredible privilege. You have intimacy with the Father. <coughs> Excuse me. Wow, with the Father. You have this intimacy with the Father. It's, it's not... Uh, it's... It wasn't all that long ago that these newest ones in the faith had been enemies of the cross of Christ, had been objects of wrath. And now he's like, oh, no, 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 church, listen, remember, dear children, you've got intimacy with the Father, with God Most High. You had been far off, now you've been drawn near through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he says to the young men, hey, listen, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. You are strong spiritually. The word of God lives in you. I know that I've told you before, but, um, but, uh, but I, I had a, a professor when I was in high school. He was a professor at a local college, but he taught uh, advanced math courses at our high school. And and uh, I remember taking some of those classes and feeling so lost my senior year. I remember Dr. Stockdale coming up to me and saying, Hey, listen, Bartholomew, when you get to college, don't let them intimidate you. You're a good math student. Now, I got to tell you, to this day, I don't know if he was just blowing smoke or if he saw something in me that I didn't see in me, but I can tell you that when an authority on the subject said, you are a good math student, I went off to college so absolutely convinced, walking in that, my heart so strengthened and encouraged. Imagine when, uh, when, when John wrote to the, those in the middle part of their journey with Christ, and said, hey, listen, you have overcome the evil one. You have overcome. To be reminded of that truth in the midst of the daily battles that face those who follow Christ. Hey, you've overcome. And you are strong spiritually. And the word of God is alive in you. What an incredible gift of encouragement. And then finally, to the old guys. To the old guys. The old war horses in the faith. He said, oh, and listen, you have known him who is from the beginning. What a beautiful reminder to reflect back often on the faithfulness of the Father. You know that John said to these guys, he was like, hey, listen, you older saints, you have a rich history with the faithful one. And what an incredible privilege then to stand on and to live from that foundation, that historically rich 
It's like you have seen, you have heard, you have testified. You're no longer living on what you read in the book. You're living on what you have uh, read in the book and what you have experienced in God himself. And so John closes out this section with such rich encouragement. Uh, brothers and sisters, may our hearts be encouraged as well. Join me in prayer, would you? Father God, as we go from uh, our, our place of worship this morning, well, God, I just pray that your spirit would rest and abide upon the redeemed. I do pray, Father, that, that, that not one who is truly held fast in the hands of Christ would, would question in any way their relationship with you. But, Father, I do pray that I, the scriptures make it very clear that there are those who profess, who claim, who believe that they are in Christ or still walking in darkness. And God, I pray that through your Spirit you would make that very clear as well. God, not that, 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 that they would just rest in that condemnation, but that that understanding, Lord, would bring those who are apart from you to a, a spirit of repentance and brokenness for their sin, that they might find this rich welcome then into full fellowship with the faithful one. We pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hey, listen, I don't know if I've told you lately, but I love you like crazy. Thanks once again for tuning in. We'll see you next week.